Okay, so my good people, thank you all for uh, showing up on a Tuesday afternoon to join us to do this. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce to all of you, and actually the vast majority of you already know who he is, but in any case, it is my great pleasure to introduce to all of you President Emeritus Richard Guarassi, seated right here. Um, Richard has been a long time president, and I'll say a bit more formal stuff in a, in a couple of seconds, but just briefly, um, Richard been a, has been a long time president at Wagner and has overseen various things that we think are part of the DNA of Wagner College, like things like the first year program, the Wagner plan, the, the, the practically the, all of the civic engagement stuff that we do, etc. And we're deeply indebted to him for that reason. He's also a former member of our department, the Department of Government and Politics. So in that sense, he's part of the family in that sense, right? So it is particularly um, uh, 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 nice for us that Richard's new book is out on, and it's called, as you know, Neighborhood Democracy. I'll say a couple things a little more in a little more formal sense, and then I will yield to Richard, who will then tell us stuff about what the main arguments in the book are, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A. I will say one thing, though, that once Richard is done, for the Q&A, I would invite you to form a line here to come and stand here at the lectern, at the podium, and speak up, because um, it may not be possible for us to hear you when you ask the questions from the back. The other thing is Lee is recording it, and it needs to pick up, the sound needs to pick up, yeah? Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, Richard Gorassi uh, was the longest serving president of Wagner College, becoming president emeritus on his retirement in 2019. He joined the college in 1997 as provost and vice president for academic affairs. He was previously dean of Hobart College as the Hobart and William, Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Prior to that, he served as a faculty member and dean at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. He has served both as a member of the board of directors and the board chair of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, Campus Compact, the Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities, the New American Colleges and U Universities, New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, and Project Pericles. He has also served on the Civic Learning and Democratic Engagement National Task Force and the Anchor Institution Task Force. So please welcome, ladies and gentlemen and others, Richard Gorassi. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. They were making me stand behind this podium so we could record all this. Normally I would be in the middle with the students talking to each one of you and having you introduce yourselves to me, but we don't have that kind of moment here. So thank you all. So many good friends in the audience. If I start naming them, we'll be here. We'll be 410 before we know it. So just say a generous hello to everybody and to the students who don't know me. I'm so happy to be with you. Thank you for coming to this event, and I hope this will be uh, somewhat inspirational for you in terms of the role that you play uh, in, in your own democracy, the role that you play in your own society, and what, what challenges you face, and what role uh, you can play as a college student, as well as a civic professional once you leave Wagner. So, with that, let me just sort of introduce the book. Um, and I won't go through this book, it's, a, it's an elaborate book, there are lots of stories and chapters in here, but I've tailored this really to, to you, to the students in, in the room for the most part. So <clears throat> higher education has, from its very origins in the United States, had a civic mission. It's always been wedded to, in one way or another, the society in which it lived, and then later on the democracy which was built as a republic. Always. If you look at every mission statement for every college, public or private, over hundreds of years, you will always find some reference to citizenship, that we're educating students in part, not only, but in part, to become effective and engaged and responsible citizens of the United States. That's an essential part. Benjamin Franklin understood that, who started the University of Pennsylvania, um, and understood that to be, we would call it a liberal arts college with a practical bent, so the practical liberal arts here at Wagner, uh, that it was always about doing, but thinking and learning and being critical thinkers, thinking expansively, being innovators. But he always understood that without an educated citizenry, without an engaged citizenry that was well informed, that had a sense of learning and growing together, that democracy was increasingly fragile. 
So there's always been this civic mission. Now, that is the essential part of this book in the sense of what is the civic mission today and what moments are we living in uh, at, this, at this very time. And I, you know, given the backdrop of, I'm sure all of you are reading and seeing the visual aspects of what's going on in the Ukraine, what's gone on in the United States in terms of all kinds of uh, racial interactions around policing, around inequality, uh, around white supremacy, all these different elements that surround you, the climate crisis that we all face as a, as a, as a world, never mind as a nation, this is the time you're living in. There, and na Generations are called up to be responsible for taking care of the time in which they live in and beyond. And so this is your moment, in a sense, of how do you want to operate within these confines? What is your role, and what role does higher education, colleges, universities play in this as well? So I believe, and this is the argument of the book, that we face a civic imperative. We face a moment, in fact, when higher education civic mission is most critically needed, that we need to educate a generation of transformational leaders, now more than ever. Uh, it is absolutely imperative, given the crises that we're talking about. And so the way I approached the book was to say that uh, there are three specific crises which are critical to us at this moment in terms of the civic mission of higher education. One is the crisis of democracy. We can use the Ukraine as a, as a classic example, but we can use the United States as a classic example of the way in which school boards are being challenged about what students can learn, about what teachers can teach, if in fact they're, they're liable legally if they teach incorrect things according to whatever school board or regents that they, they're, they report to. Uh, we're living at a time of censorship, or left, right, and center. Uh, we're living at a time when democracy itself, the, the right to vote, is in question dramatically. At a, at a time when, in fact, new groups who have been shut out from the political process are suddenly emerging again in a way of ascending their own rights, but the rights of the whole population. So this is a moment where there's a real crisis of democracy. There was the insurrection in January 6th. There was the Charlottesville uh, insurrection, if you want to call it that, where who would th have thought that we would see people parading around in Charlottesville, Jews get out, we don't belong here. You know, this is, we, you will not, meaning all people of color uh, and all ethnic differences, you will not replace us. This whole notion of white supremacy. So this is a dramatic moment for democracy and for the role that we all play, and particularly I'm addressing myself to students that you play in terms of engaged citizens in trying to build what I assume we all want, which is a fair, just, dynamic democracy. Uh, we want a, a democracy that has equity, a democracy that has high participation, a democracy that's caring and fair, but also dynamic and innovative. So that's crisis number one. And I'll put up some visual illustrations in a second. Crisis number two, simultaneous, is the crisis, growing crisis, of inequality in the United States. And it has all kinds of class and racial overtones, right? Those are the features of that inequality. As you'll find in a second, the level of inequality by income and wealth in the United States in 2022 rivals 1914 with the, uh, with the, with the uh, advent of the federal income tax. So think about before the federal income tax, when there was no social security net, there was no federal income tax, that the level of inequality that existed there. Uh, and now think about all these years, 100 years later, with all the investments we've made through government programs, that the level of inequality by race and class is worse now in some ways, or at least rivals the level of inequality at that time. So that's another level of, 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 of another crisis of sorts. And I'll, I'll show you some data that we'll look at in a second about how that, that inequality is growing. Uh, and we'll say something about the dimensions of it spe very specifically in the community here that we live in, in this larger Staten Island community, and a community in which you had partnered for a long time called Port Richmond, not too far from the campus, which we'll talk about in depth. So those two crises alone, the crisis of a growing inequality, of unjustness, unfairness, the denial of the right to vote in key ways, the crisis of democracy writ large and small, those two crises call for a civic imperative by higher education to commit itself to building and rebuilding and forcing and developing democracy. Without a democracy, there is no free, uh, uh, there is no freedom to learn, no freedom to discover, no freedom to speech in the way we understand it. Higher education is built on the notion of the freedom to learn, right? That's what it's about. It's about critical thinking, both in terms of what we teach our students, but we as critical thinkers who work here. And institutions of higher education are, in the United States are based on that they are free institutions in that regard to pursue scientific questions, environmental questions, 
cultural questions, all kinds of ways of, of seeking new knowledge and uh, testing old knowledge. But without a democracy that's vibrant that respects that right of the institutions of higher education, uh, there is no higher education. It becomes politicized to, to a, a level which that freedom to, of thought is highly questioned and compromised. So those two pieces require a civic imperative, plus the notion that higher education itself needs a vibrant democracy to survive. And that means that we need to be more active, students in particular, but faculty, staff, with our neighbors and in the surrounding environments to protect those and to address those two crises, democracy and inequality, and, and, and what I'll call institutional racism, which is quite different from prejudice or bigotry. Those are other issues in our society. But institutional racism is the way in which resources are distributed uh, educationally, economically, in a way that disenfranchises or limits those who are shut out of that system, what, I'll, what I'm going to call shadow neighborhoods. So when, the time when we most need higher education to play a role to defend democracy, expand democracy, it finds itself with the third crisis. There's a horrible fiscal crisis of higher education going on. It's been going on for a while where the revenue base of higher education is deeply compromised. Uh, think about when I say a fiscal crisis, there's revenue and there's expense. Revenue is flat, expenses are growing, and all of higher education outside of the top 50 schools who have you know, billion plus dollar endowments, which is like 95% don't, all of those schools, all of those institutions of higher education are finding themselves limited and fearful of spending money in any way, shape, or form which doesn't have a direct material impact on this year's budget. So that's crisis number three. When we need, we need higher education to play a greater role, it may think it can't. So this is what my book is about, uh, Neighborhood Democracy. That's the story. So let's go through, if we can. Uh, I think I have this right. So I'm going to talk about neighborhood democracy. I'm going to talk about this a little more. I think I have the right button here, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to talk about these parts towards the end. We'll come back to this slide at the end. But what I mean by neighborhood democracy is that local communities are involved in their creating their own destiny, or are involved in creating the conditions of their own destiny. So you're going to see when I talk about anchor partnerships and neighborhood partnerships between universities and these neighborhoods, shadow neighborhoods, equal, equal partners in that, not doing for these communities, but learning with and growing from, as well as they grow from and learn with higher education. We'll see a new type of citizen politics emerge, politically and civically engaged, communities that have long been ignored by the political process or shut out of the political process, a focus on community assets, not just um, pathologies. We're going to see these communities engage in this kind of work, focus on the assets that are already in these communities. There are many of them. It's a lot of talent and creativity, <coughs> ingenuity, and also institutions built here. We're going to address inequality, institutional racism, climate change, and so on and so forth that affect these local communities through a partnership between what I'll call allies and anchors. And we build the practice and culture of an equitable, inclusive democracy. So that's the argument I'm going to make at the end. But let's start with, if we can, some of the visual impact. So this is, and I don't, don't focus, I want you to see trends more than actual numbers here. This is more to be illustrative. I should go back to the microphone for, for, for Lee. I wander too much when I talk. Um, so what, what I want you to see here is just these, these growing lines. Here's a level of, of uh, average household net worth by race. Here's white, here's, here's African American right here. So in this period from 1999 up to 2019, what you'll see is the increases, differences, disparities between white communities for the most part and black communities. Hispanic communities in here. In, 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 and of course, Hispanic is a, is a term that relates to so many different subcultures, right? So many different ethnicities. It covers a lot of different things. So that's one. And then if you look over here at overall wealth and inequality, you can see the overall index of inequality over the same period of time going up rather dramatically. Slowed a little bit, slowed a little bit before the pandemic. And of course, we know with the pandemic that we had that data, we, we begin to see more of this go up over here. So that's, the, that's the, a part of the uh, crisis of, of um, inequality. I'll, and I'll say more about that in just a second. Well, let me, say, let, me, let, me, let me pause there for a second. So how does it manifest itself in visual ways? Well, first of all, uh, we have essentially a system in the United States, and particularly in cities, and New York is a prime example of educational apartheid. We have residential segregation, 
and we have students of color going to schools in neighborhoods in which they live or surround them. Those neighborhoods are underfunded. The access to college is limited. The funding and support for overcoming some of those inequalities is very limited. And so we find that in those, in those neighborhoods, they're forgotten, they're pushed aside, they're outside of the political process for the most part, they don't have the same access. And children growing up in those schools have very narrow lanes of opportunity. You know, wealthier students have wide lanes of opportunity. They fall off, they get in trouble, something happens, parents get divorced, domestic violence, whatever may happen in that neighborhood, there are a lot of different ways they can get back on track. There are a lot of other assets. But folks in poorer communities don't have that width, that bandwidth, and they're off, they, hard to get back on track. So here's one, here's one factoid that should stick in your brain, if you don't already know this. If, it's, if you're a black boy in a, a going, a, a, a ascending to the fourth grade in the United States, if you're a black boy going into the fourth grade and you're not on the fourth grade reading level by then, your chances of being incarcerated sometime in your life is 80% greater than if you were a black boy who was on the fourth grade reading track at the beginning of the fourth grade. I'll go over that again. You're going into the fourth grade. You're not up to snuff in terms of your reading ability at that moment. Your chances of being going to prison sometime in your life are 80% greater than if you were on the fourth grade. So reading becomes, in an odd way in the United States, destiny. Destiny. And in fact, reading we know affects math scores later on. And if you want to go to college and you're not ready for algebra in high school, you're not going to be put most likely on a college track. This is called institutional racism. This is the way it manifests itself. The way schools are supplied, resourced, the quality of teachers they have, the quality of resources available for learning, the quality of their technology in their school, and never mind the surrounding environments of after school programs. That's how institutional racism manifests itself. My wife, Karen, is sitting here who at one time was working at Columbia, uh, was working with new teachers in Harlem, at a school in Harlem, and with students with a, a school on 33rd and 3rd in Manhattan. Not too far away from each other, same city, same state, same borough, all right? You would think that distribution of resources would be equal, schools would be similar. The school in Harlem, schools in Harlem that she was working in, kids were having a very hard time Teachers, when they got to be 40 years old, tried to get out of those schools as quickly as they had, so there weren't a lot of older, more mature teachers. She would tell me when she would go to those school buildings, she'd have to keep her feet off the floor because rodents and rats would be running around occasionally. Uh, when she went to 33rd and 3rd Street, another public school, not a charter school, not a private school, another public school, it was like being in a private prep school. It was a white school predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly. And it looked like it was double, triple the resources and the quality of the buildings and the, res and the resources, the technology was different. See, that doesn't require someone to hate you. It just means that the way in which politics works is to distribute funds to where they get the payoff, where, the, where their support is. And that, that begins to have a racial, well, it, doesn't, it has a racial component to it. And so, as a friend of mine used to say in the civil rights movement, if you're not at the table participating, you're likely on the menu, okay? If you're not at the table, you're, it's an old civil rights thing, you're, you're on the menu, okay? And that's what happens to neighborhoods like this. Poor neighborhoods, particularly brown and black, which are shut out or ignored in the political process in ways that really count. Uh, so that's, that's how the inequality stuff in a visual way manifests itself. The, the levels of democracy I talk about, polarization, so on and so forth. This is a democracy index worldwide that The Economist magazine puts out every year. The darker the shades, the more authoritarianism. The lighter the shades, the more democracy. So I just give you that as a visual. We, we have a good sense, if you're reading the newspaper, watching the news today, both domestically and internationally, have a sense of that democracy itself is in peril. We're living through an interesting moment when, and I'm going to use this term in a very broad sense, 19th century term of liberal government. Not liberal, how much state spending you want versus conservative, but liberal in a sense, do you believe in the rule of law? Do you believe in, in the basic Bill of Rights? Do you believe in the political parties to be able to organize themselves in, in free and, and fair elections? That's what we mean by the, the liberal state in that sense. And that authoritarianism is, is essentially presenting itself in China, in Russia, and other places as a better alternative for people. And quite, quite frankly, we're in the fight of our lives to, to defend democracy. But democracy itself has its own issues, to, as I'm indicating, to clarify. So here's the argument of the book. Given the level of, of the crisis of democracy, given the level 
of the crisis of inequality, given the need for institutions of higher education to be involved in restoring and, and in enhancing democracy and creating a generation of transformational leaders for an equitable, just, interracial, inclusive, dynamic democracy, uh, the, the, the question's up for us. Can we do it? Can we put it back together again? So these neighborhoods, these shadow neighborhoods, need allies, new allies, uh, not in the normal play of things, where I think higher education can, and has played a role. And that <clears throat> these neighborhoods need anchors, institutions that aren't leaving their neighborhoods. So what are the anchors in these kinds of communities? Well, churches, K through 12 schools, anything that's not able to move away, right? Churches don't move away, for the most part. Institutions of higher education, college, universities don't move away. Uh, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools don't move away. Nonprofit institutions that have been built to support that community or funded to be in that community, they don't move, move away. Local foundations, here in, in, on Staten Island, we have three banks that have foundations, don't move away. So those are anchors in the community. And so these communities need anchors and allies, and by the way, my argument's going to be, Higher education needs them, because higher education not only has a revenue problem, has an en has an enrollment problem. And guess where the least amount of college going comes from? From shadow communities, where there's little support for them to be on college track and to protect them so they can actually prosper. And all the creativity of those children can manifest itself more dramatically in our society as leaders and innovators themselves. So the key part of this argument that I'm making is that we're living in a time when we need allies and anchors, and, and higher education needs to expand its enrollment base and its naked self-interest. Forget the moral and political arguments for a moment, which I don't think we will forget, the civic arguments, but just on the naked self-interest, it needs to reach out to these communities to grow their own students. The students of color, brown and black, who are not attending, who have, if you spend any time in these schools that I, as I have, who have incredible creativity and energy, but get pushed off that track, as we talked about. Too many of them, not all of them, of course, but too many of them early on. So the argument is that anchor partnerships, this notion of universities partnering with these communities, what, do mean, what are they partnering about? They're partnering about tutoring and mentoring for kids to get on the fourth grade reading level, to get on the third grade reading level, to, to be able to be there for them by being present in that school, by being able to provide the resources, the way we purchase, the way we hire uh, people from those communities to work on our campuses, the way in which we can create all kinds of activities to enhance children to become leaders civically involved in their own community. So anchor partnerships are built around those relationships. So let me give you, a, first of all, a little more illustration. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, no, this one here. Oh, this is the financial crisis. I won't labor this because it, it'll get us too involved in the weeds, but this is the crisis of higher education. You can see that on the very end over here, a revenue is kind of flat here. You see it starts to flatten out over these years uh, from about 2,000 going forward. It starts to decline. This is all pre-COVID. It's worse now, okay? And you can see that expenses have been going up. So this is so-called the fiscal crisis of higher education. Not enough funds, if you will. And, and now it's kind of complicated because as I alluded to, uh, the demographics show that, in fact, the number of college students, the number of college-going students decreased by one million uh, last year in the United States. And the demographics don't favor that much of a change. So, you know, when you read the newspapers, you get beguiled by um, stories about Harvard and Cornell and Columbia and Princeton, and they think all schools have all this money. Th th those are a handful of schools. Out of the 4,000 institutions, 100, or maybe at best, are located in that kind of world. The other 3,900 are in a completely different universe. So let me take us a little more, more uh, forward in my visuals. This is, again, uh, what we call the discount rate, the amount of money that colleges spend on their own financial aid, the amount of money they get from tuition that they give back to students as institutional scholarships. Good for students, although the prices have been climbing, so not quite as fair as it sounds, but the, the rate of discount, so to speak, uh, has been going steadily up. This is, this is first year students, and this is all students, and this is from about 2011 to 2021. So this is a big expense item. In other words, colleges take it 100 cents on the dollar for tuition, they give back about 48 cents back, which means they only have 52% to spend on hiring faculty, hiring staff, building, having residential life programs, having a dining service, 
all the, all the things that go into making a campus. Um, so that, that, that's a big piece of what we're doing. So I want to show you, I want to move to, uh, let's get out of this. Okay. So what is, an, what is a, a neighborhood partnership? What does it look like? I'll use five or six examples. I'll start with Wagner, what it was doing from about 2010 to 2019. But I don't want you to think this is about right now. I'm going to show you five or six other major institutions doing similar things. So at one point, Wagner created, uh, along with the Port Richmond community, and we have sitting with us somewhere in this audience, I can't see his right here, is the former pr uh, principal of Port Richmond High School, Tim Gannon, right here. So Tim was instrumental with us at, at the college in forming an alliance uh, and with other priests and uh, religious folks and nonprofit folks, as I, as I talked about earlier, in creating something called the Port Richmond Partnership. We looked around as an institution in 2009, eight, and said, instead of just having a lot of civic engagement from students go out into the community, we had a lot of it going on, never mind the practical work done in nursing and PA and stuff like that. Is that just having it scattershot? Can we make a difference in these communities? Can we strategically locate 70%, 60% or more in one neighborhood of need where we could really dig in with that neighborhood around the issues that they face and how we can marry some of our assets, mostly social capital or hard work and labor, uh, open up our campus to make the campus visible and accessible to these communities, create a notion that there will be college-bound students here in this community, and we're going to show you what college looks like because our students will reach out to you. The campus will be available to you. We'll hold events on the campus. But we're also going to enter into your schools with tutoring and mentoring and the like. So we put together this partnership. And then it grew to understand that you can't just do that part without doing all the health care needs that these families face, all the trauma these students face in many ways in terms of counseling services, all, all the other services that we need and the like. So we put together the partnership. And we focused it, and we had a center for leadership and engagement on the campus, uh, which organized all this work, or at least it went through this work. And, and uh, so there was a center. Uh, there was a dean at, at one time, a director. And we, we chose these five areas to work with. We, we felt these were sustainable. We don't want to promise more than we can deliver. And we did a, um, a, a very uh, exotic feasibility plan. We got a $50,000 grant from one of the foundations. Worked with many, many community leaders in Port Richmond. Uh, to say, what do you need, and how can you marry that part of your needs with what we can provide, wh what we're good at. Uh, we chose Port Richmond because Port Richmond was a community of about 11,000 people. It's two miles from here, if you haven't been there. And um, it was predominantly undocumented Mexicans who were coming from Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, and, and a good percentage of African-American students, and then a, 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 a smaller group of white working class New Yorkers. So it's a a working class neighborhood to poor neighborhood, depending on what part of the community you're looking at at any given moment. So that's what we chose. We felt that the families were stronger and the religious organizations were good and intact, that we had a chance of sticking there, that, that there was support in that, in that community more than some of the other communities. We were involved in lots of communities in Stapleton, and Park Hill, and so on and so forth. But this is the one we said we could really put a decent amount of resources into in partnership and grow together. They helped change Wagner in many ways. Wagner became much more, we, we were becoming more diverse. When I became president, we were 9% students of color. When I left in 2019, we were 29%. So we were changing as an institution. We were a white institution that was changing. Um, and not, not perfected by any means, but we were moving in all the right directions. And people were feeling better about being here and having a role and having a voice. Lots of work, lots of work to do. You know, we live in the United States. Everyone's coming from a neighborhood that virtually is segregated when they get here. That's the nature of residential segregation when I talked about educational apartheid. Everyone has learning when they come to this campus. How do we learn to live and work together? How do we create a sense of community together? It's a hard thing to do. There are only three places I know that happens in the United States. The military, the corporate world to some degree, and universities. That's about it. Churches are all segregated. And most everything else, K through 12 is all segregated for the most part. So th these are one of the three institutions with a chance to create an experience of an interracial uh, inclusive uh, community. And it's hard because we're all coming as strangers to one another when we get here. So that said, we put together this, this partnership. It, 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 it ran a good long time. Uh, we found these, these five areas. Uh, I'll start with the backbone. The backbone was what I talked about right here, the educational partnership. And this was ultimately led to, start with Port Richmond High School with Tim, where we created a series of programs where our students uh, were involved in the school, we had an office in the school, it's still, it's still there, 
which we uh, uh, personed, personed every day with a, a po per, po people who work for us, and and the schools and the school itself, um, and it became the Wagner Seahawk. What is it called? The Raider Center. The Raider Center, because they're the Raiders. They're the Port Richmond Raiders. It became the Raider Wagner Center. The mayor came to visit. All kinds of things happened there. Kids were involved heavily. Not only the students we were directly involved with, but students in the school generally could stop in that center just for communication, help, assistance. And it became a very vibrant, dynamic place for students. All kinds of students in there. So then we realized to do the kind of work we wanted to do, we had to reach back to the middle school. Actually, Tim came up with the idea. Why don't we do, why don't my, the Wagner students are doing all this work in our building. Our students are beginning to see people who look like them, who go to Wagner, who are in college, are successful, are very approachable, engaged, um, and other wider students as well came with them who were bilingual. Uh, and we began to realize, I can do this too. I can be a college student. I never thought about that before. And I'll give you one big story in a second. But that what Tim said, you know, my high school kids want to be involved, so let's get them involved with the middle school that comes, the, that, that is the feeder school to the high school, which was IS-51 in Port Richmond. And then we reached out to PS21, which was the elementary school, to create the pipeline of students going to PS21 who were going to IS51 for middle school, who then would go to Port Richmond High School, more or less, they could have a choice, but more or less they were going to Port Richmond High School. And then they could go to Wagner if they could get in and get support. we we'll talk about that in a second. Or they could go to any other college. And we had about 48 students in a program called the Port Richmond Leadership Academy. And I think it was 47 went on to college. We chose to take, for the most part, students between the 75 and 82 average. We were not looking to cream the top to say, oh, look what we're doing in these kids, because they're going to college anyway. We wanted the students who had all the creativity, all the ability, more than they realized. And we wanted to get them involved in their own community, involved in the college, demystify college for their parents and their families, and get them on campus and engage with our students and vice versa. Our students learned a ton from the community. I could tell you, so I'll tell you two stories. Here's a story about the community itself, a student in the community. Young boy by the name of Pedro Santiago. Pedro grew up in the Bronx. His mother was pregnant with him when she was 15. By 16 years old, his father was in jail for manslaughter. Uh, a lot of domestic violence, a lot of problems in the family. The mother, young as she was, right, uh, eventually moves to Staten Island as he begins to grow. Uh, and she's a home care worker, which means she's getting no benefits. Uh, she's making minimal amount of money. Uh, Wagner helped in this community as part of this arrangement, helped start a charter school called, called the New World Prep. Started it with one of the no big nonprofits, Project Hospitality, one of the big nonprofits on Staten Island, and a few other sponsors. That's a vibrant going school right now in Port Richmond, in addition to the public schools. So Pedro, by sheer accident, ends up in that middle school with his mom. Um, he meets a wonderful teacher there who was a Wagner graduate who came out of some of this work, who is now teaching there. She lights a fire underneath him. He's a chubby little kid, a lot of things going against him. He doesn't want to be at home. His school is a sanctuary for Pedro. So he tries to get there as early as he can and stay as late as they'll let him stay in the, in the building. She gets to him and says, you know, you should get involved in the track team. So he gets in and loses a little weight, starts to get, you know, he's in middle school, gets, you know, he's not going to the Olympics, he's just going to be on track team. He gets involved in student government. So com comes time for high school, he's going to go to Port Richmond High School. He has the fortune of running into the principal, Tim Gannon, who takes one look at him and realizes this kid has ability much more than he realizes. So he says to him, we have this program with Wagner called the Port Richmond Leadership Academy where you can be engaged with our Wagner students in the summer as well as throughout the school year, taking courses with them, doing all kinds of enrichment programs after school. It will really you know, expand your skill set. I don't do that. I don't do college. Nobody in my family went to college. We don't know what college is. How do you even pay for such a thing? I'm not going to college. I'm a home care worker. I'm going to be a home care worker. Well, you need leadership. This is where all of you look at students become leaders, OK? So Tim doesn't take that, <laughs> that no. As, as an inevitable no. He said, no, you're going to do it. And kept on banging and banging at him and banging at him. Pedro goes into the program. So he's now in this program as a high school student at Port Richmond High School. Needless to say, and, he, and it's in the book, there's a whole story about Pedro in the book. Needless to say, he runs into these fabulous Bonner leader students at Wagner and others. And he realizes, as he says, that a lot of the stuff I had to deal with in my life, some of these kids had to deal with. And now they're in college and doing well. And it began to open him up. 
And so Pedro excels in the program. The program was about academic work, civic engagement in Port Richmond with our students, and the like. Uh, summers as well as all year round. Pedro graduates, gets a scholarship to Wagner, comes to Wagner. Now he's a Bonner leader working with kids back at the school. So Pedro graduated from Wagner, I think it was two years ago, okay, uh, majored in African American studies, I think it was his minor, uh, Spanish, and civic engagement, I think, I forget, I probably have another major in there somewhere. He's now at the University of Connecticut getting a master's in counseling because he wants to work with students in communities like Port Richmond in the future so he can help them make that jump. So that's the power of the work. Other side of the story. We had a, we had a, a, a young student named Kelly Griffiths who was a talented young woman, from white, white student from Long Island who came here bilingual. Uh, she got involved in the civic work. She got involved in the Port Richmond work. She volunteered her time at El Centro de Emigrante, which was the immigration center at the time, the predominant one in the community. Because she was bilingual, she worked with families on basic skills. Just basic, basic skills. These are families who don't speak English for the most part. They don't come out of their houses because they're afraid of the government's going to arrest them. You know, they have their kids going to school. They're frightened to death that they may not make it home. There's all kinds of tensions in the school. So Kelly begins to work there. Uh, she's a sterling student at Wagner. Um, she gets a Fulbright scholarship to go to Latin America uh, as she graduates, but she was so affected by the work she did here that her goal was to do the Fulbright, learn as much as she could in these different cultural settings, and come back and work as a teacher in Port Richmond at the very schools that she had mentored. Now this Kelly, with a Fulbright and a grade point average was off the charts and all the rest, and a gorgeous looking young woman, could have named any private school in New York and tripled her salary and everything else going on. No, she said, I'm gonna go back to this community, which shaped who I became as a young teacher and as a woman. And I wanna go back here, and this is in the book as well, I wanna go back here. And she worked in, in Port Richmond, up until last year, she worked about four or five years in Port Richmond, at PS20, I believe, and I forget the other school. Now she's working in Queens, in Elmhurst, similar kind of work. She met a guy, they fell in love, they're now living in Queens. Uh, she's a fabulous person. If you go on the Wagner website under Citizen Alum in the Alumni Office, you'll see a beautiful interview with her. So those are some of the examples. I could go on and on with examples that would light your imagination. So this program, this Port Ridge Partnership, you see involved all these different pieces, immigration, advocacy, health and wellness. Our nurses and our PAs played a big, and our pre-med students played a big role. One of the students who got involved in health and wellness was Anthony Tucker Bartley. Anthony Tucker Bartley came to Wagner, African-American student from the Pittsburgh area, came to play football, played on the football team for two years, could have played all four years, but he wanted to be a doctor. And he, he hurt his hand in his, his second year, so he stopped playing football. He got involved in the civic engagement work here through the center. And Anthony was just a dynamo. We got him a scholarship uh, to Johns Hopkins one summer, his junior summer as he was applying to medical school, he had a chance to work in a big research university setting. He lit a fire there. He was the most responsible young man I think I've ever met. So he graduates Wagner. He, was a, he started a chess club in the high school and at Wagner. And the high school kids coming over to play chess with our students. It, it was remarkable. So he just graduated from Harvard Medical School. Wagner College, poor kid, came from outside of Pittsburgh comes to Wagner, gets a great education in Wagner. The civic world shaped him. This is what I want to do. I want to be a doctor in these communities. I don't want to be a corporate doctor. I don't want to make tons of money. I want to be here. This is what I want to do. So Anthony now is in um, residency in Boston. So there's another example of the kind of power of the work. Uh, I could talk to you about the faculty members I write about. Some of them are here in this book. Uh, about the impact it has on the faculty members here at Wagner doing this kind of work and how it shapes their lives and others. So that, that was... That's, the, that's an example of an of of anchor partnership. The goal here was to find how we could increase uh, college completion to decrease the inequality gap in this community, create leadership within the community and on our campus so that be, we begin to raise that generation of transformational leaders. Right? That's the goal. The goal is a fair, just, dynamic, intercultural, interracial democracy. If you don't, Dr. King told us one thing for sure. I think he was an incredibly courageous human being. We tend to make a little cartoon out of him. But he's incredibly courageous. He had a sense that you have to have a vision of what you're trying to build. 
What is the mountaintop like, he would say. What is it the goal? You may never get to the goal, but you can get a lot closer to the goal than if you know where you're going, than if you're just advocating but don't know where it's going. Because when you advocate, whether it's around police issues or educational issues or housing issues, and you win a little victory, you still feel like you lost. You haven't changed that dramatically. But if you have a sense that we're building something for the longer run, okay, and I pass it on, then you have a sense of accomplishment. Because I've seen so many movements be defeated because they feel like they got somewhere but not enough and then it started to reverse. Resiliency is a big piece of this. So let me tell you about some other examples. So you don't think this is just all about, about um, Wagner and, it's, and it's, it's anchor partnership, it's neighborhood partnership. Rutgers, Newark, big public institution in Newark. You know, Rutgers has several campuses. New Brunswick is the home campus, but Rutgers, Newark is a very profound campus. Um, Steve Greenwald, one of our distinguished friends here on the, on the faculty at Wagner, who is an attorney, uh, as an undergraduate, went to Rutgers Newark, right, and graduated there, went on to NYU Law School, became a famous Hollywood attorney, and so on and so forth. Works pro bono for years and years and years on capital punishment, working with prisoners on death row, predominantly in the South, and almost always prisoners of color. Um, that was his home school. But Rutgers Newark is led by um, a phenomenal president, they put together a huge anchor neighborhood partnership. It's actually a citywide partnership. They created a center for, for, for teachers to support teachers in the public schools. They created, created, similar to Wagner, a K through 12 set of partnerships with about 60 different schools in Newark, working through students at Rutgers Newark, mentoring, tutoring, civic engagement, and leadership. That's the key piece. They have to go together. Otherwise, it's just about getting a college degree. It's about helping these students become not only well-educated, and prospering in our own life, but becoming leaders. Right? The leaders of our democracy need to come out of these communities. This is critical for us as a nation. So Rutgers Newark has the Newark City Learning Collaborative, as I mentioned, tutoring and mentoring coalitions all over the place among citywide organizations and nonprofits and foundations. It has the Cornwell Center, uh, which involves Essex Community College, Rutgers Newark, Pilar, which is a private institution, Berkeley College, which is a for-profit, and New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is a research institution. So they, they are partnered in a similar way around this kind of work. Um, they spent a lot of time most recently developing very prescribed ways of spending a lot of their money on local businesses and also hiring from the community. It's a big piece that can happen in a, in a community like Newark, where you have an institution of that size. So hiring, how we spend our money, how we, how we hire people, in addition to all the transformative work in the school itself. So that's the Rutgers Newark one. University of Pennsylvania, big Ivy school, right? Rich, wealthy Ivy school research institution, 40 or 50 Nobel Prize winners over the years. They've been involved in West Philadelphia schools a oh, good, good 25 years now in trying to make an impact there through the Netter Center. Again, same sort of situation. They have about, a, they have about um, 160 courses that have civic engagement components to it that are strategically organized around a set of schools in West Philadelphia. West Philadelphia is a very poor neighborhood. Philadelphia is one of the poorest big cities. I think it may be the poorest big city of all the big cities in the United States. Um, so they, they have the Penn Reading Initiative. They have, I said, the, the, the community schools program and the like. Um, Another, another good example is Augsburg University. It used to be Augsburg College. It's in Minneapolis. It looks very similar to Wagner. It's in the middle of, of Minneapolis. There's a lot of schools in Minneapolis, University of Minnesota, and so on and so forth. But along the corridor, this one corridor in, in Minneapolis, are where Somalis relocated in the, after the, as in the wars of the Civil War in Somalia. And the Lutheran Charities, because Augsburg was a Lutheran, school, is an active Lutheran institution, set up this relationship with this community to really help you know, reach out as good service, to reach out to this community to help these immigrants. And over time, uh, this, this community became, this Cedar community became a very important community. So they began to change Augsburg. First it became Augsburg College to Augsburg University. And it began to reach out through the same dynamic of tutoring and mentoring, engagement, leadership, job hiring, job preparation, all these different pieces that the community needed. Augsburg began to get its students involved, its faculty involved, its staff involved, partnered with the community, opened its campus up. And I'll tell you one funny story. I was at an important retreat at that institution for a national organization I was working with. We were holding a three-day meeting at Augsburg College. 
We're in a, a room at three times the size of this. It was their kind of uh, religious spiritual room. And on the, on the wall, huge, I mean, maybe half the size of this wall, was a painting of black Jesus. Black Jesus. Now, this, is a, this was a lily white Lutheran school for many, 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 many years. And Paul Pribino was the fabulous president. I said to Paul at the, one of the breaks, I said, uh, how did this happen? How did black Jesus get here? He said, well, that's because we've changed. We got involved in this community. We began to change our admissions profile. We we're much more diverse now than we were before. We had to accommodate visually our commitment to, to each other. So this, I said, well, whatever happened to white Jesus? He says, turn around. Way back on top of the balcony, there's the old white Jesus up there. He says, we keep him, but we just have changed the orientation of the, of the institution. But that was an example of the work they do with the Somali community. I can go on and on and, uh, about, about Augsburg. Again, same size as Wagner, same kind of financial dynamic. Rutgers Camden, another Rutgers school, has a tremendous program called the LEAP Academy. Uh, it involves 13 public charter schools that they've helped start, plus the K through 12 schools. Uh, again, heavy, heavy inducement in terms of mentoring and tutoring and the like, with lots of success, lots of students going to college, as, as the Wagner program had. Miami-Dade College in Miami, you ready for this? 165,000 students on the campus. Let me repeat that. <laughs> Wagner's 2,000. 165,000 students in the campus. Very big in Miami, particularly with the Latino community, but also the African-American community. It's a, it's a, it's a transmission belt for, for a lot of these folks who can get through it. A lot of adult learners as well, not just traditional age students. They had a just retired phenomenal president uh, who had come from that school. He had uh, originally uh, grown up uh, in Puerto Rico. And he made a huge difference. He dedicated himself and dedicated his school to really serving that community. So they have just under 6,000 courses that have civic engagement involved in the community. So students are learning about this or that. And they're also part of their learning, as you know, involves field work and community work in a strategic way, organized by offices on their campus, so that it, the work is transformative. It just isn't one-offs. It continues the kind of support that the community needs. There are 220 community part organizations involved with them. Uh, and um, they're very heavy in Overton and Liberty City. If you know anything about Florida, those are heavy African-American communities, which are um, quite challenged economically. Um, Overton is 75% black, 20% Latino. The median family income in Overton is $30,000 a year. Uh, right next door is Liberty City, similar dynamic. The median family income is $21,000 a year. So these are really important engagements here, not just to do for, but with. It's changed Miami-Dade College over the years in terms of who they are and how they see themselves and who goes there. And the last one I'll tell you about is, uh, just so you have a sense that this is a national effort, uh, is the University of Nebraska in Omaha, which I spent a lot of time at over the years. So what they did, Omaha is a very dynamic city, uh, a very diverse city. You wouldn't think it. We think of Nebraska as kind of predominantly white place, but it's a very diverse city. One of my baseball heroes, Bob Gibson, came from Omaha. You probably don't know who that is. Um, one of the great pitchers of all times for the St. Louis Cardinals. A great man, great um, civil rights activist in his own way. But what, uh, what um, Nebraska Omaha tried to do, John Christensen was the president, was to say, look, we have to make a serious commitment here. They did. They were heavily involved in lots of ways that we've been talking about. But they decided to get a funder to build them a building on campus to put all the nonprofit community organizations in their own building on campus uh, so that it could be the constant interplay between the institutional um, staff, between the faculty and students right there on the campus, and the community can be part of that campus in a very dynamic way. I've never heard of anybody else doing like that. That was really, is quite remarkable. So those are examples of, of, of community partnership, anchor partnerships. Uh, are they successful? What do they do? Are they financially viable? Is this just, you know, good intentions, but they kind of die on the vine because colleges, as they mentioned in the beginning, are finding themselves in a resource-short world? So let me tell you why it's in the financial interests of institutions of higher education. I've stopped appealing to my fellow presidents and, and others around why they have a civic uh, commitment to this in their own charters, to, to saying it's in your own self-interest economically to do this. First of all, students on campus who were involved in this kind of civic work, the data is unbelievable. The level of increase in student retention, student retention means students stay at the college and keep growing, keep on learning, 
That, those are financial dollars to the institution. That means people are paying some kind of tuition, right? So those are dollars coming into the college and university. So student retention goes up. Student completion goes up. Lots of states like New York get funding supplemented to them from the state for every student they graduate who's at a certain economic level. It's called the Tuition Assistance Program. I used to chair the board of that, that Higher Education Services Corporation that did that. The GPAs of students involved in civic engagement goes up significantly as compared to the others. And there's a lot of data coming out of UCLA, big research institution, done a lot of tracking of this. So students are doing better, they're staying in school, <clears throat> they're, they're graduating, of course they're learning more. There are all kinds <clears throat> of indices now about uh, civic competency of these students, diversity competency of these students. So they're learning skills. So just on the, on the naked side of the institution, more money, better learning. I used to say that to, um, when I used to address um, audiences of chief financial officers from around the country, I'd be brought in to talk about some of these things. And I'd walk into a room, predominantly of white, white um, vice presidents for finance, and they'd all be reading their, if they weren't on their phones, they'd be reading the, the Wall Street Journal. Here comes this boring speaker, we'll have to get through this and get to the next guy. And I would say, loud as I could say it, Good educational practice increases net tuition revenue. And they would put their papers down and start listening, okay? So it's in the interest of institutions of higher ed to do this. Never mind that part of the goal, the civic mission piece, is to teach students what I call the arts of democracy. The arts of democracy. What are the arts of democracy? First of all, it's establishing your own voice. Secondly, it's listening to others and developing a sense of respect for the legacies each of us brings in our own way, our own authentic selves and histories and legacies to the table. But it's also about learning the skills of negotiation, mediation, coalition building, action, assessment, responsible engagement. Those are the, that's how you build a democracy. You have to have all those skills. And you put those skills together with a good undergraduate education about critical thinking, right? Being able to understand the nature of evidence, how to make a, 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 a effective uh, argument, uh, based on evidence and reason. Those are the skills you're learning how to write and communicate effectively. Those are the skills of an undergraduate education, particularly in a liberal arts school like Wagner. You couple that with the arts of democracy and you begin to build transformative leaders. Right? They're engaged, they're articulate, they understand how to bring people together, how to understand mediation, to listen and hear each other, and to build together something powerful, maybe powerful like affecting the destiny of children in this neighborhood. So <clears throat> that's that's one piece. Obviously, higher education as, a, as an industry, right, writ large, has a growing problem of demographics of static, if not declining enrollment. If it doesn't raise more students up, you're not going to have as many colleges. I mean, not anyway, but you're not going to have as many colleges and universities. Their own individual cells are on the line. So if they could reach out to shadow communities where there's low college attendance, and begin to engage them when they're elementary students, as we have in PS21, by working with their parents and their guardians to show them that college is not only affordable, but something attainable in palpable ways by giving them access to the college and the campus and the students, and learning the skill sets of reading and math and the like as they progress through the school, while also developing a civic consciousness and practice and learning these arts of democracy as they grow and mature then we have a chance of doing something rather dramatic. So, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll end with this, that um, the civic imperative we face, one pathway to deal with it in higher education would be simply to say, well, we educate more students and we hope that they're, because their education, they'll be more um, effective as democratic engaged citizens. Not, not enough, okay? Oh, we can say, look, we can really begin to build uh, a civic imperative around the notion of we are partisans for democracy. The kind of democracy I talked about, an intercultural, engaged, dynamic, just, equitable democracy, an inclusive democracy. Something that is that the, the goal that we, we seek, how far we can get there, if we're here, can we get to here? Can we cut it in half? Can we cut the inequality in half? Can we cut the engagement, up the engagement dramatically? So that's, that's the goal, okay? that for a long time, higher education likes to see itself as nonpartisan. We don't get involved in politics. Well, that, that, that era is now over because politics is getting involved with you. It's taking away your liberties, your freedom, what you teach, how you teach, who can teach, who can learn, who can go to school, who can afford to go to school. 
So clearly, partisans for democracy in this broader sense, I think it's part of the civic imperative. So the last thing I'll end with, the pandemic has done a lot of damage to these kinds of programs because people weren't able to do field work. We weren't able to send students out. We weren't able to have faculty involved in ways that they had before. People were learning virtually. Uh, at Indiana University, where I sit on one of the advisory boards for the Dean of Arts and Sciences, virtually everyone was, uh, was, was, was not on campus, was not engaged with the world around them. Uh, and it's kind of odd because there's now a generation of sorts, if you can use that term, of college students now who've never, never known anything different than that, than virtual learning and some kind of hybrid learning. So that took a big starch. A lot of the, the, the economic fall off in the short run in these institutions not only limited the ability to be engaged with the community, but also to afford to sustain some of the staff involved. So what's happening now, uh, in a lot of conversations, a lot of institutions, is they have to rebuild. Rebuild the relationships in the community, rebuild the partnerships, find the resources. There's an awful lot of money on the table from lots of foundations, national, international, and local, that will support this kind of work. It means you have to take the time and effort to make the case, to bring the community along with you, make the case, and sustain and underwrite the, the effort in addition to the kind of natural benefits that I mentioned that come and accrue to the institution. So that's neighborhood democracy. Why do I call it neighborhood democracy? You can see now, back to that original slide, if I can get there. Yeah. So let's just do this to end. So if you have an engaged community the way we talked about it, uh, we have a new kind of citizen politics growing out of these communities themselves and with college students and the campuses together. We have uh, a politically and civically engaged communities that have been ignored by the traditional political process for the most part, uh, we, we, where there's not make, so I'm gonna have to just tell you, I, we, Karen and I once were working with uh, East New York um, in Brooklyn, which is a really difficult, high crime, poor black area. And what they wanted was to have a high school. They don't have a high school in that community. And we were working with them and the local leaders would take us aside after we gained their trust and confidence. We knew each other, we trusted each other. They would say, look, in this community of New York, when you come out of your home, what you see is a prison right here. And the, and the notion, the, the visual for these young kids when they're six, seven, eight, ten years old, is that's where you're going, particularly boys. You're going to that prison. There's no college here, there's no high school here. There's no other model here. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. These are kind of ignored neighborhoods. All right, so focus on, now this is one of the basic elements of organizing 101. You don't go to a community with the community and focus on all the things that are wrong you start focusing on some of the things that are right, and you build out from the assets a sense of success and accomplishment building towards those mythologies. Uh, and so that's, that was the approach that we took in Port Richo. That's, that's a basic one. That's what happens in this community that are engaged in this way. So I can read this. Oh, right here. Um, so that you begin to address institutional inequality, institutional racism, to some degree, a lot of these uh, partnerships are also involved in climate issues. I, I didn't go into that myself here today, but a lot of these partnerships tend to focus on environmental and climate issues as well. Of course, there's a whole racial climate conversation itself. Why are these communities the communities which are used as kind of receptacles for a lot of the offsets of, of climate change? Um, asthma, all kinds of diseases and, uh, and the like. And then we build a, a culture and practice of an inclusive democracy, which is the piece right here. So I say it's not just anchor partnerships or neighborhood partnerships, it's actually neighborhood democracy. It's another element a US political scientist can think about, an informal element within the political system, which I call neighborhood democracy. Thank you for listening, I appreciate it so much. So if you have questions, comments, and believe me, there's nothing too basic. I, I taught here for 20, 21 of my 22 years, I would always tell students, ask anything, even like, what did you, what's that word you use? Or, or a fundamentally big, big question, like, how can we pay for this? Or something like that. So this is your chance to ask questions, uh, challenge ideas, present alternatives. This is the fun of having a conversation together. Hopefully I've stimulated you enough. Steve, you have a question? Sure. Yeah, you want to come up here because he wants to get to it. Yeah, this is going to be, let me introduce the distinguished Dr. Steven Snow. <laughs> Get out of your way. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Snow. I teach in the government department. Welcome back, Richard, Karen. Good to see you. Yeah. Boy, it seems like old times, right? It does. <laughs> a lot of us in the audience as well. 
You know, I have to admit we've heard you talk about some of these things before. <laughs> But that's, that was really one of the fun things about reading this book, is we saw some of these ideas develop as they developed, yeah. right? It didn't come into your mind as, a, as an entire book. We sort of saw it happen right. a little bit at a time, how these policies develop. You know, first we did the Wagner Plan and then the Port Richmond Partnership, and I, I found that really enjoyable. I'm gonna ask uh, two questions, sort of a micro and a macro question. Uh, one's a difficult question, I think the other's an impossible question, a political <laughs> question. This is good. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm curious, we don't get a chance to talk pure politics, you know, usually in the past we've, we've talked about what's going on at Wagner. But in terms of the policy, in terms of, uh, of what you've, you've laid out, one of, the, one of the things you focus on is to not look at these communities as strictly sort of centers of pathology, as you, as you put it here. But I think it's it's difficult to do when you're, when you're 18, when you're 18, 19 years old. You're from a different community, you're from upstate, you're from wherever, you're not exposed to different people, different circumstances. And I think a challenge here is to avoid having students' prejudices reinforced by these experiences, right? Because they come to these neighborhoods and they see, I think, unless there is some sort of training or some sort of preparation, which is my question really, is how that can be accomplished, they will tend to focus on the pathology. They will tend to reinforce these prejudices that they already have. If it's the person who's worried about uh, being deported, you know, they're going to think, oh, that there are all these people here who are whatever the yeah. prejudice or, or, or stereotype happens to be. And it's, it's difficult. This is a difficult question. I think I don't expect a, a comprehensive answer because once these things become institutionalized, of course, sort of becomes part of the bureaucracy, for lack of a better word, sort of people become taking part, maybe without the sort of training and background or ideas that, that you have, and it's difficult, I think, to prepare some of these students for coming into the, these, these different communities they haven't been exposed to before. And then the, the macro question, the political question, the sort of impossible question, is uh, relates to the, you bring up Richard Hofstetter, right, and I always appreciate a good uh, Hofstetter citation, Paranoid Style in American Politics, a very old piece from uh, Harper's, I think, 1964. And his argument is that the old right wing thought its role was to protect the, the sort of in-group from the incursions of the outsider. And then the new right wing thinks that the outsiders, the bad guys, have already taken control. They're already on the inside. And so it's sort of the John Birch Society was the example that, that he used. And this is what we have today, right? Except we've got it magnified, we've got it sort of in this grotesque version, right? The Supreme Court nominee is now being used as sort of a, a fodder for, for uh, senators to appeal to their QAnon constituencies, you know, basically calling her an apologist for, for pedophiles, you know. And what on earth can we do to step back from that sort of political impossibility that we're in? Good, good, good. good. I, lo I love these questions. So let me give you the response to both those questions as best I can, because we have to think our way through this, right? These are, as you said, difficult. So, uh, you know, I didn't, it, sometimes people think when you become a college president that when you were born, the doctor took you out and said, look, here's a college president. No, you have a whole history of a career. I was a faculty member, I was an organizer, I did lots of different things in my life before I uh, was able to have that, this position. So, when I was teaching at Hobart and William Smith, uh, you know, pretty lily white for the most part, not exclusively um, liberal arts college in upstate New York, but it was in Geneva, New York, which had been a stop on the Underground Railroad, so it had a very vibrant black community. And when I got there, I reached out to that community, and as I was the dean of the college, I was appointed as dean of the college, a professor of political science. I initiated the first, what we then call service learning courses. That was courses that had field work, service work built into the course. I now call those community-based learning because it's more about the community where it's located rather than notion of service to the community. So I want to reinforce Steve's point. So I, one of these courses I was teaching was called Community of, um, uh, community Politics and Service. It was a political science course. They were all juniors and seniors in the course. And um, so I put some students in uh, a soup kitchen, three students. Actually, one of them is a rather famous sports commentator now. And um, I put them in, they were working, in, and students were in different places. 
And I, even though I was the dean, so-called dean, he's involved in titles, I was the professor. So I would go visit them at the site of service. I thought it was my responsibility to see what they're actually doing. So I went, showed up, took the day off, said I'm going to be in the soup kitchen with these kids. We're going to prepare the meals. We're going to clean the institution. The air was going to, people were going to eat. I was ignorant of what I was. I expected old people bent over, you know, looking like they were war torn to come through the doors. And uh, of course, when the doors opened, most of the folks were of color, and most of them were under the age of 15. It were women and children. But there was this one woman who came in, properly dressed with a hat and sort of gloves that she took off, white woman, uh, very proper. And these three white kids I told you about, who were in my class, who I put there, were constantly making fun of this woman behind her back. They were making all kinds of jokes. This was the voyeurism that Steve's talking about, how you can reinforce the worst values if it's not attended to. So I took the time at this moment to say, OK, I could react and scream at them right now, or I'm going to let this go. And when we finish and we're doing the cleanup, I'm just going to approach them a lot of questions. So I started off by saying, hey, did you see that crazy lady with the hat on? What was she all about? And they started making every kind of joke about who they could imagine. I said, but, but do you think that, do um, you think she lives by herself? They thought about that. I said, do you think maybe her children abandoned her and she's all by herself? Maybe her husband died or partner died? Um, do you think, you think she has some challenges because of that? Maybe she's depressed and anxiety ridden and suddenly she became real to them. You know, she had to, uh, that my job was to deal, this is what's important about any field work. It's, it's the experience, the ideas you're trying to get across, the experience of the students in the field, and then the reflection part. What did you see and what does it mean? How do you react to this and how the work that we're studying inform any of this? How do you learn from this? How can you grow from this experience? So I learned early on, my point was that, just Steve's point, that unattended, irresponsible, throw them into the field, no training, no preparation, can develop, can reinforce all the worst attitudes of bias and prejudice. Poor people are poor because they want to be poor. They don't work harder, you know, all that junk. So, um, so it does require training, preparation. Sometimes it can be in the classroom, you know, if the, how you're, depending on what your class is, or it needs to be. That's why I would argue back over here, you need a center. Civic Engagement 101, if you want the Civic Engagement ac uh, Accreditation, a piece that Wagner has at the moment, you need a center. Centers organize things. They are people responsible for training, for allocating people, for making sure they show up on time, for working with the partners to make sure they're getting what they need, to make sure the partners are responsible to the students who are in the field. So you need a center. You need a center that organizes, helps organize the faculty, connect with the community, and so on and so forth. Faculty aren't, can't do this on top of their own backs. They're doing a thousand other things. So that's piece number one. So I do think there's a fear. In my book, I talk about the service learning courses I taught that could reinforce, without attending, all the biases. This is careful work. This is hard work. This is, you know, I, as political scientists, I think we could use this term, political work, right? We mean this in the broadest sense of politics, not partisanship, but political work. It's civic work. So that has to be attended to in a careful way. I saw it at Wagner. We did it in the first year program where students would go into Port Richmond and be introduced there. And I know they, re, they, 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 were, they had fear. This is a community I'm, I'm, I don't know who these people are, how they think, what they look like. This is not my experience living in some suburb, suburb somewhere from wherever I came from. Well, that's the work that we have to do together in the reflection piece to say, OK, why do you think what you think? That's why we keep journals, right? Why do you think what you think? Let's hear from different voices what that experience is like. And then students grow. I've watched students grow dramatically from being partisans in one way and open to bigotry and, uh, uh, and, and unrecognized privilege and bigotry to grow and to understand, hold it. There's another world out there. The world that I grew up in, which every world you grow up in, you think that's the natural world, right? So I watch students grow. That's what an education is about. Is that's why it's called a liberal education, to liberate you from being a prisoner of simply your own experience. That's liberal education. It doesn't mean liberal conservative. It means you know, liberate you to be free, to be, see the world wide and deep, to see other points of view, other places, other histories, other cultures than your own, and to understand your own culture more deeply. So that's what education is about. So that's point number one. How we deal with the paranoid style, which you know, Hofstetter's, this is a great article if you haven't read it. I'm telling you, the students in it, well as others. It's, it's worth reading. You can get it online. The paranoid style of American politics, because the extreme right, <clears throat> racist, anti-immigrant, nativist, 
peace has always been in the United States as an element, whether it's small or big, depending on the period we're talking about, has always been there, and that was Hofstetter's argument. That's always there. We always have to deal with it. I mean, it's not new to people of color. They've been dealing with it all their lives, but it is to many other people. So the point is to engage it in a way, call it out. You know, one of the, as difficult as the times are now, one of the things that's interesting about the time now, there are no masks anymore. People just say racist stuff straight out loud. Well, fine, now we can hold you accountable. So in my classes, when I would teach, particularly when I was teaching introduction to American government, not necessarily here, but other colleges, when students would say stuff that was just uninformed, ignorant, bigoted, I would let them talk. I'd encourage them to talk before anybody could jump on them and just get it all out so we can get it out. And then we, can, then we can say, okay, in a gentle, humane way, let's test your assumptions. Where does that come from? Why do you think poor people are poor because they want to be? What evidence do you have for that? Have you ever, 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 you know, and you begin, have you read this piece? Have you read this person's biography? Have you read this? Suddenly, you want them to be open their minds to see the world differently. That's what an education is supposed to be about. So I think we always have to be vigilant. We're living through the crisis of democracy. I mean, I, to, to looking at Steve because he raised the question. This is the fight of our lives in some ways, you know, both domestically and internationally. And we need to have a generation. I keep on saying the same thing of. I don't like the term progressive because it means too many different things to different people, but I like to know transformational leaders. If we think that we had a, a, a generation of transformational leaders at the advent of the republic, as flawed as they were as human beings, ignoring obvious inequalities, but they were geniuses in a design of sorts that, that was bigger than they thought, or at least potentially. And in the civil rights movement, we had people in the 1950s and 60s marching, arguing, being attacked physically in all kinds of ways. You know, these were a lot of people who were not formally educated. There was a genius of leaders, Fannie Lou Hammer, Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin. I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, if you read of that period, there was a genius to really talented leaders, almost all of them of color, who put together an incredible movement of people who were thought were too ignorant to vote, too intimidated to vote, who those people became marching for their own rights. And we got a civil rights bill that changed Jim Crow. It didn't change economic inequality, but it changed the formality of it, which is an advance by, by all means. So anyway, I don't want to belabor too much. This is the, the time we find ourselves in. Thank you, Steve. Those are good. They're, but they're not, there are no easy solutions here. Okay? It's about resilient. At the end of the day, I said to myself, I'm not abandoning Port Richmond, even though I've left Staten Island. And I think many people have to have that attitude. We're there with our, with our friends and, 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 and neighbors. Any other questions? Yeah, we have, yeah, way in the back, come on up, and then we have Cyril we'll probably just sign us yeah. off here in a second. Sure. Very I'll just hand the mic. Super. Here, I'll give you the mic. Right. Oh, we get to see you. Um, uh, when you mentioned uh, Augsburg University and also the a uh, Somalian population that they work with it made me um, remember this book that I read a couple years ago called Faithiest by the uh, his name is uh, Chris Stedman and he's known for his tagline um, he is an atheist that does uh, interfaith work mm -hmm. so um, I know that Augsburg has done an, an, a lot of um, interfaith work with the Somalian uh, Muslim immigrants and so I'm curious like within this space of neighborhood democracy um, have there been or has there been any consideration of trying to, um, I guess, like engage or develop these partnerships in consultation or within, you know, some of, you know, the churches, the mosques or other places of worship. Because I think, um, especially for a number of these, um, you know, communities of color or immigrant communities, there is a huge emphasis within um, their faith practice. And, you know, when they see their faith leaders or hear their faith leaders say X, Y, and Z, and you know, will emphasize the importance of one, two, and three. They will tend to follow. So I'm curious, you know, how if there have been any examples of those type of, uh, you know, collaborative partnerships at the interfaith uh, level. Good, great question. Actually, introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, my name is uh, Ange Concepcion, and I serve as the dean of campus life. So yes, the answer is yes. There's that whole group, national group called the Interfaith Coalition. I think. Where's Ruta? Ruta's here somewhere. Where's Ruta? She had a leave. She had a leave. Okay, so she was involved here at campus. So Ibu Patel, Ibu Patel, started, who's a wonderful national leader uh, who himself um, is not Christian, formed this national coalition amongst tons of colleges and communities around interfaith, 
uh, including agnostics and atheists who are humanists. Uh, and there's a huge movement to involve specifically a lot of this work around interfaith dynamics using churches, mosques, um, temples, so on and so forth. Um, you know, it's funny because it's a different orientation. And so a lot of the civic work prior to, let's say, 1980 was came out of a Christian spirituality which was about charity. And the charity model is doing for others. But the civic model is doing with others. So this new moment of inter interfaith is about doing with others and learning each other's traditions. And uh, as a friend of mine who actually is a wonderful 1959 graduate of Wagner College, Jewish graduate, one of the first Jewish students here, uh, Dr. Goldstein, Alan Goldstein, who became later in his life, his, his father was a deliverer of eggs and dairy products as a working class guy. Alan was so happy to to come to college at all and came here in 1955, graduated in 59, went on to become the dean of the medical school at George Washington University, famous doctor. But he has this phrase, his, he has two daughters, one, he's Jewish, one daughter became a rabbi, and the other daughter rebelled against all the Judaism and became a Catholic. And they weren't talking to each other. And I love this metaphor, because it works in this whole interfaith dynamic. He says, you're both on different roads to the same place. I love that metaphor, because you can use it in a lot of different ways, right, in a lot of different circumstances. Spiritually, you're in different religious traditions. You know, instead of hating each other, realize, you know, you're all in the same place uh, towards uh, some kind of spiritual sanctuary uh, and nourishment. So thank you. It's a good question. Yeah. I should take some of my own advice. I'm Cyril, by the way, and the Gov Department. I don't think I said this in the beginning. I <laughs> forgot. But anyway, um, actually, most of you know me. But So Richard, I'm going to ask a question related to the phrase transformational leaders, right? OK. Do you like compliments? Do you like compliments? Nobody likes them. <laughs> I didn't think so. OK. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I think you're right about this. But I think what you're suggesting is predicated on transformation. The ironic thing is that you need transformational leaders for this to work. Mm -hmm. You're one of them. Nancy Cantor is one of them, right? Like, so this is the thing. So I would like you to think, speak a little bit about the challenges that happen when the whole thing is dependent on one or two transformational yeah. leaders and what happens when there's a vacuum when they leave. Okay. Yeah? So, so this is a big question. So let me, let me uh, approach it, first of all. I'll be very autobiographical. I don't like being autobiographical, but I will with this question. So I started my career in 1973 as a visiting lecturer. Visiting le that meant don't unpack, you won't be here next year. Okay? <laughs> I, was, I didn't have my doctorate. Karen and I were married. We were gonna, expecting our first child. She was a teacher in school, reading teacher. We were just 26 years old. And I sat in the president's office with students at St. Lawrence University so they could get co-ed housing. Now, what was I thinking? I mean, talk about career enders. But the point I use that, not to make myself a road, that's not the point. You can lead at different levels of so-called hierarchies. I, I, I tried to be a good leader as an instructor there with my students and supporting my students. You, try, you can be a leader as a junior faculty member, a senior faculty member, as an undergraduate, as a freshman, a sophomore, all the way to a graduate student. You can lead from the middle, the top, and the bottom. It's easier at the top. You know, I was, as I said, I wasn't born and put at the top. I had to, and it wasn't a goal of mine to get to the top. It's just where I ended up in my career because at some point I said, when I was at St. Lawrence University doing other kinds of programs around this kind of work, but it wasn't partnerships like this for, per se, um, that I think I could lead an institution to do the right thing. That people who were leading these institutions were careerists. They were more worried about their pension funds than anything else. And then I thought, if, if you're a person of, uh, if you're a progressive person, I'll use that term now. I don't want to use left, right, and center. If you're a person of, of justice, then uh, we should be able to show we can govern better, that we can govern more inclusively, with more particip participation. Yeah, when you govern, you have to make difficult choices. You have lots of different constituencies with different interests. You have to sort of figure out how to balance those in a way that the equation works for the whole institution. You make some difficult choices. But the point is, yes, I understand Having somebody at the top who believes in these things make it easier. Having trustees who believe in these, or regents, believe in these things makes it easier. But that doesn't mean you have to wait for the Messiah to come. You have to start leading from wherever you are and building things and putting 
pressure on the institution, finding positive ways, finding grant money, finding support, building coalitions on your campus from different student organizations and faculty members and the like, whatever it is. Find a way, tell your story nationally, get national. I did that a lot when I was at St. Lawrence Hobart as a, as a faculty member. Get national credit for what you're doing on your campus. Bring those national resources and attention into your campus. It, you never, you're never a hero in your own home, but you can bring that, that notion back into the campus. So people say, oh wow, I can be validated. I had many faculty members I would work with saying, gee, we went to this conference. People are doing similar things. And they, they looked up at what we were doing. And I said, yeah, so let's bring that home, feel better about ourselves, because at home you're always in contest. You're always in competition. So I do think leadership matters. I learned that early on. That's why I chose to take that path in around 1988 when I chose to go in a different direction. I said, I think I can do this. Um, and I should do it, because I think I have a better idea how to do it, more just and humane idea. Not to say that I <laughs> anything but as a spotless record. Uh, but uh, I think leadership matters. But it matters at every level, not just one. Let me end it here, because we're getting to tell you've been here a long time and patient. Thank you so much. I wish I could, if you're, if you're interested in hanging around a little bit of students, I'd love to get to know who you are and the like. My old friends, of course, I want to see and spend time with as well. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure.